will start when people actually have a chance to hear me. Hello again. So um, this session is about PHP unit best practices. I hope that there's at least one thing useful for, ev uh, for everyone in there. And if there is nothing, oh, I, can, I think, I hope I can, and I, can, I can skip that. Hi, my name is Sebastian. I do things to PHP and with PHP for a really long time now, I think 15 or 16 years. Uh, yes, so, and if there's only one <laughs> thing <laughs> that I would like you to take away from this session, don't use the pair installer anymore to install PHP unit. Um, I announced that a couple of weeks ago that the pair installer is no longer a supported way of installing PHP unit. I did not anticipate this negative outburst that followed on Twitter by people bashing the pair installer, like good thing that it finally dies and it never serve the PHP community very well, that's not something that a piece of open source software deserves. Yes, the parent installer has its problems, but it served the PHP community for a really long time. Um, Steek Bucken had a really great vision when uh, he started the pair project and the work on the pair installer in the really old days between PHP 3 and PHP 4. Don't bash a piece of software. Yes, it's not shiny, it's not new. Um, it served us for a while, and I think I have talked enough about it for now. Don't use it anymore. Um, I'll turn off the pair channel for PHP unit no later than December 31st. I hope that I will be able to turn it off sooner, but as of last week, there are at least 10,000 downloads of PHP unit per day that are still coming through the pair channel. And, and that. Sorry? All the official documentation has not been mentioning the pair installer for quite some time. We let it know, uh, we started educating people a long time ago don't use this, use the other methods. And then recently we made t took the next step and said, hey, it's no longer supported. There will be no more new releases of PHP Unit on the pair channel. And the last versions of both PHP Unit 3 and PHP Unit 4 that you can get from the pair channel will print a warning every time you run PHP Unit, hey, you're using something that you don't want to be using. Okay, so what's the best practice to get PHP Unit? Um, if you ask me, use a FAR. A FAR is a PHP archive. It's, in my opinion, one of the most undervalued features of PHP. It has been around for a really long time now. It allows us to package a library of PHP code or a tool such as PHP unit into a single file with all of its dependencies. You only have to download this one file and you have everything you need to run and use PHP unit. And basically all <coughs> command line based tools in the PHP world are now, well, the ones that are relevant, although what's relevant is a subjective uh, opinion, I guess. Um, all the tools that I use, and of course including the tools that I created and maintain, use FAR or are available as a FAR because it's so simple. Download the FAR and you can immediately use it. You can Im immediately use it like this. Just point your PHP interpreter to the FAR and it works. <coughs> Usually you want to do something maybe like this. Have a, um, it's on, installed on the system level so it's globally available. Just rename the FAR to PHP unit for instance. Move it to user local bin, make it executable. It's on your path. You can just type PHP unit like you're used to if you've been using it um, installed through pair. And it just works. 
you don't really have to read this, no worries. It's, all, it's also the only slide where uh, the font is so tiny. Uh, of course, you can also install PHP unit via Composer. Um, to be honest, I'm not a big fan of using Composer for installing tools such as PHP unit. And um, I'm not alone with that opinion. Lucas recently tweeted, using Composer instead of Pair to install PHP unit means downloading the internet. That's both a good thing and a bad thing in one. Uh, uh, in one. It's a good thing because one of the main focuses of PHP unit development over the last couple of years was to break up the big monolithic thing that PHP unit once was into smaller components that can be <coughs> worked on in isolation from the other parts of the system. So if I need to add a new feature re regarding code coverage or make a bug fix related to mock objects, I don't have to make a release of the whole thing. I can just focus on this one component, make my change, test it, and make a release of just this one component and I don't have to do it for the big thing. But it also means that other developers out there can build entirely new testing tools, testing framework, testing frameworks based on parts from PHP unit. So for instance, Behat, for instance, uses uh, PHP unit's assertions library and it just depends on it and it uses it. And in my opinion, it's a good thing to split up the big PHP unit thing into smaller things. But of course, if you use Composer to install it, well, you have to get all of these dependencies, all of these dependencies otherwise it doesn't work. This is especially a problem um, in continuous integration because the best practice if you're using Composer is to not check in your dependencies, your vendor directory into version control, only have your Composer JSON in version control, and then every time you want to run your tests, for instance, use Composer to install all the dependencies, including PHP unit, and that means downloading the internet. It takes half a minute, yes. Um, time that could be spent better and it's every time you build and yeah. So, but it's also another problem because uh, sometimes on that server where you're running Jenkins or even if you use or try to use Composer on your live system, your production system to install your software, most of the systems that I work with or more of most of the production environments that I work with don't have a connection to the internet. They cannot download the dependencies. So that's another problem. So m what I really like to do is to put the FAR of PHP unit in version control. Put the FAR of the tools that I use on the project into a directory in my version control. So that way the continuous integration server does not need to download the internet when I want to make a build. The tools are already there. Every developer working on the project has the tools already in place when he or she makes a checkout from the version control and can just use them. And it also means that every time I update one of the tools, it's a commit that triggers a new build with that version. Yes, that would also happen if I were using Composer, but the biggest benefit is that everything is in place and does not need to be installed. If I can access the repository, I have all the tools that I need. So for a typical project that I work on, I have a directory called build tools and I have PHP unit in there and other tools like PHP auto load builder, PHP depend, PHP mess detector, PHP copy paste detector and all these tools. And in my build script, I like to use Apache and because I'm not afraid of Java and I don't like um, porting tools from one language to another just because I don't want to touch that other language. I don't see much point in there. Yes, the Fing project um, is doing a great job for about 10 years now of porting AND to PHP, but to me, it never offered anything better than AND. And AND 
is usually easily installed and Java is there and just works. It's a, uh, it's a standard. Yes, please feel, feel free to ask questions anytime. Don't wait until the end, which is a very German thing to do. <laughs> um, in one of your previous slides, you mentioned uh, the usage of PHP units or what we decreased in some of the mm -hmm. implementations. Uh, the usage of PHP units together with HSTM. Um, we also mentioned a couple of times that unit tests can become useful if they are fast and, and mm -hmm. So PHP unit runs on HHVM. Yeah. It's one of the projects that the HHVM team at Facebook looks at to verify its feature parity. <laughs> it was actually the first project or the first framework that Facebook was interested in to run for 100% on HHVM because they have hundreds of thousands of unit tests for their code base and before they deploy their code on a completely new runtime, they want to make sure that everything works. Yeah. That's why I helped them a couple of years ago when they started on this to make PHP unit run on back then hip hop for PHP, which was the PHP to C++ to native code thing, like the first generation before HHVM and also now um, to run on HHVM. So, in a nutshell, yes, you can use PHP unit on HHVM. Yeah. Mm. Your own code, of course, as, long as, uh, as long as your own code. Yes, if your code, if the code you test works on HHVM, then you ca can, can test your stuff on HHVM. However, if you're not using HHVM in production, I would not suggest running your tests on HHVM just because it's quicker because then it tells you, yes, it works on HHVM. And if you're using something, a different runtime in production, that doesn't make sense. Your testing environment should be as close as possible to what you use in production. Um, but a follow up on the same question, but it's off topic then. Mm -hmm. You're showing thing, but did it become Sting also? Um, this, is, this is ant. This, oh, is an, this is an ant build script. But I, I, I don't use thing. I don't know whether or not it runs on, on HHVM. But it, I, I would assume that it runs on HHVM, and I, but I would assume that it's not going to be quicker. No, because of the XML part. No, because it's built orchestration. It's putting into, into a script tools in the right order with the right arguments that should be invoked, and those tools run on the command line. Yes. And yeah, the logic is not in, in inside thing. It's just or, uh, organizing and orchestrating the build steps. Okay. Yeah, so PHP unit works on HHVM. Not everything works perfectly yet. Um, HHVM has pr um, some level of support for code coverage, for instance, and what it offers with regard to code coverage, I'm already using and leveraging in PHP unit 4. Hopefully this will get better at some point. At the moment, the code coverage reports of the same tests on the same code base look different depending on whether you use PHP plus Xdebug or HHVM. There are some issues there. They are working on them eventually. Um, it's not high on the priority list at the moment. Don't know why. Um, yeah, but we have to see. At some point, um, it will be better. Okay, another back next best practice, be descriptive about what you are testing. And that means um, coming up with a descriptive name of what you are testing. So for instance, if you're testing something like a class that gives us a value object for a monetary value, like a money object, and we want to test that we can negate this money object. Of course, you can name your test methods, test one, test two, test three, and so on. And yes, I have seen that in quite a few places. It's not very helpful. Because when such a test fails, it can only tell you test one, two, three, four has failed. So what does one, two, three, four mean? I don't know. Um, so try to come up with something as descriptive as this. Test can be negated. 
And if you cannot come up with a name that is concise or contains, or if, you, if the name you come up with contains the words and or or, then you're t t testing more than one thing. Don't do that. Only ever test one aspect of the uh, software you're testing in one test. Otherwise, the test can, on can only tell you A or B is not working. I don't know which. Figure it out. That's not why you want to do automated testing. The test should be precise. It should, po could, should only have one reason to fail, and it should point directly to why it's failing. Also, if you name your tests the way that I have just shown, you can leverage a feature of PHP unit called test docs, which is just a different output. Test docs. So for instance, we can see, yes, we are looking at something that is called money. And something that is called money, for that can we, we can re retrieve the amount, we can retrieve the currency, we can do other stuff, and we can negate it, and I have a check mark. And the idea here is that tests can be seen as an executable specification for the code, executable documentation for the code, really valuable. With this output, I can go to a non-technical person and s say, hey, this is how we understood money, a concept from your problem domain, is supposed to work. Did we understand it correctly? Yes. Good, because then we are we're already done. Because all the check marks tell us that the code exactly behaves the way <coughs> that this thing reads. And if not, we can have a discussion based on this and figure out where we misunderstood something and fix it. Really valuable. Be explicit about what you are testing. Of the code you are interested in. So for instance, while the tests are running, PHP unit can collect so-called code coverage data, which code are actually executed while a particular test is running. And if you say, for instance, in the money test class covers money, then all other code coverage that may be collected while the tests of this money test class are run will be discarded. We are only interested in money. Ideally, our tests for money never execute any other code other than in the money class. So we don't really need this. But it makes it more explicit. It makes it really hard um, to write tests that um, accidentally test more things. You can also use it on a method level and be really specific. And the test can be negated. Test, we are only interested in code coverage for the negate method of the money object. We are also executing the get amount method to verify the thing that we want to test, but I'm not interested in code coverage for that method in this test. I'm interested in code coverage for this test, uh, for this code in another test that tests whether or not get amount works correctly. And the reason why I implemented this feature a couple of years ago was that I saw many test suites that tried to test just to generate huge amounts of code coverage. <coughs> One of the really worst examples that I've ever seen was for, a, not going to name names because I don't like to talk bad about other open source projects, pretty popular and famous and um, if you l executed a single test for a central part of that framework, you got somewhere between 40 and 50% code coverage for the entire code base. So everything was green, just with one test. 
So looking at the code coverage report gave you a false sense of security. Oh, it's green, it's tested. I'm not actually verifying in that test that made this line look green whether or not that line works correctly. I probably verified something com somewhere completely different, but it's green, you don't know. And that's why I came up um, with this feature. Next best practice, use the most specific assertion possible. Yes, every first heard false. But when one of those assertions fails, you don't really get valuable feedback. What will PHP unit tell us if this test fails? We have an array, the array has an element. I have a search true based on the return value of empty array. If this fails, and it will fail, unless PHP is broken or PHP unit is broken, which we don't assume for now, um, what output do we get? What can PHP unit only tell us? I expected the value to be true. It was false. Is this helpful? Not really. So it prints F for failure, failed asserting that false is true. Yes, of course, I could add an option argument in the end. I expected that the array was empty, whatever. But there is an assertion called assert empty. It works on PHP arrays and on any object that implements the countable interface. So, when this fails, PHP unit tells us failed asserting that an array is empty, much more valuable. And I don't have to do anything else than telling PHP unit through using a specific assertion what it is that I want to test. And suddenly I get useful feedback. I always debate with myself at this point whether or not this is actually a best practice because it should be common sense. Um, and I guess the line between common sense and best practice is blurry. Actually use assertions. So what happens if I run this test? It passes, is that correct? We don't know. So, around the same time I was looking at the test suite of that framework that I mentioned earlier, the one where you could run one test and got huge code coverage in, uh, across the entire uh, source code. There were also a lot of tests like this in there. Tests that just ran code without assertions. Again, giving you a false sense of security because running code without having an assertion in there, the test can only tell you, yes, it did not crash. Which is already nice to know, but it would be better, yes, it does not crash and it actually works correctly. Would be much better. <sighs> so the number of assertions should be somewhere in the same ballpark than the number of tests. That was exactly my idea for about five minutes. I thought it would be sufficient back when I implemented the assertion count. So it even shouldn't be less than the number of tests. It shouldn't be less, yes, that's also good, but you can have as many assertions in a single test as you want. Um, so for about five or 10 minutes, the time it took to implement the assertion counting, I thought, yes, this is okay. But then I realized, hey, I can have two tests and one has zero t uh, assertions and another one has two assertions and I will get two tests, two assertions, and I don't know. That's when I started working on the strict mode. And the strict mode used to be an all or nothing feature in PHP unit. As of PHP unit 4, it has really fine granular control over which parts of it you want. Um, 
around the world, basically outside of Germany, almost everyone I meet refers to the strict mode as the German mode. <laughs> <laughs> because it tells people that their tests are doing stupid things. I don't know. Um, it's easier to use now because you now can turn it on uh, only the parts of the feature that you want. Um, back then it was just dash dash strict. Um, now it's report useless tests, so get, get this. And what it does is PHP unit now counts for each test whether or not that test actually asserted something. And it counts both the explicit assertions that we have seen so far with assert true, assert false, assert equals, whatever. Um, if you're using the expected exception annotation for testing ex uh, exceptions or if you have expectations on a mock object. Those three things are counted. If there's none of those three things happening in a test, it's a useless test. Because it's just running code without verifying whether or not that code actually works correctly. A useless test is reported as an R for risky. If we add the dash dash both flag uh, to the test runner, we will actually get information why this test was considered risky. This test did not perform any assertions. A risky test does not generate code coverage. So even if that co test executes code, that code will not be marked as green just because of this test. Could somebody trick it by just saying assert true true? Yes, you can trick it with assert true true or assert false yeah. false. Yeah, but I have seen that. <laughs> Truth <or> jokes. <laughs> and I was asked by the manager of that developer if I could expand PHP unit to detect that. In theory, <laughs> possibly, um, making PHP unit much, 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 much slower, doing static and code analysis on the test code and trying to figure that out. But in the end, it's not worth it. If you, it's, a, it's, it's, you cannot solve a cut. <laughs> yeah, he's wearing a, a t-shirt that says you can't fix stupid. <laughs> I was about to say you cannot solve cultural or, I don't know, communication problems or trust problems or whatever through a tool. Spending time on improving a tool is time wasted in my opinion. So the situation where I actually experienced that was the, the, the manager had bounties as incentive for the developers to have good code coverage or low complexity in the code um, or no or very few viol or few or no violations in tools f um, like uh, PHP mess detector. And yes, these tools can be tricked. And some of these trickings are intentional. PHP mess detector or PHP um, code sniffer have annotation that you can put in your code that say disable this rule for this method or disable all rules for this file. And in that case, the developer won the bounty that knew about these annotations and put, that, put th them in the code that he was responsible for. He cheated. Yes. But in the end, it came out. Um, because, yeah. And it, 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 he wasn't laughing in the end. <laughs> okay, risky tests. There are other things that can make a test risky. For instance, um, if there's output during tests that can be marked as risky. Um, if a test is annotated with to-do, that will be marked as risky as of PHP unit 4.2, which will come out soonish. Um, oh, I didn't talk about that. Well, it's not really a best practice, but news in the PHP world, such like uh, in the PHP unit world, much like the pair of PHP and .de going away. Um, at the starting of this year, we changed our release process. The waiting time between PHP unit 3.7 and PHP unit 4 was 
over one and a half years, which was too much. And we are now on a schedule with a new PHP unit release every eight weeks. A um, little bit more relaxed than, than what Firefox is doing with one release every six weeks. Um, the releases will be much smaller, like one or two features per release. But we cut down the time between feature is implemented and feature is out uh, in the wild and usable by our users. And so far, yeah, the experience with that has been great. 4.0 was a large release because we were working for over one and a half years on it. But um, 4.1 was pr uh, really easy. No problems, no migration issues. Yep. Next best practice, decouple test code from test data. A um, couple of years ago, someone approached me at a conference and said, I'm currently working on a credit rating application at a bank. And the domain experts from the bank have compiled this really long CSV file or Excel sheet or whatever with 100,000 rows. And the first N columns are the input data. And the last column is a Boolean, whether or not that person should get a credit. And I implemented um, that algorithm. And I wrote a PHP unit test that loops over this 100,000 lines and invokes the algorithm and looks at the result, expected result, and, and so on. And it works. But it's all in one test method. So when PHP unit runs it, it prints one dot on the command line because it's one test that it executes. It takes a long time to run this one test. In the XML log file that PHP unit generates, I only get one line. So in the PDF test report that I generate based on that XML, the manager only sees one test. And so my manager came to me the other day and yelled at me, you stupid developer. <laughs> you randomly picked one data set from the 100,000 and think that is enough to test your implementation. And by the way, your implementation is really slow. <laughs> <laughs> and the developer said, well, I'm running all these 100,000 tests, it's just that it looks to the tool like I have only one test. Yeah, don't give me excuses, go away, do your job properly and come back um, when you're done. So what he did then as a short-term solution was he wrote a PHP script that read in the CSV file, generated a really long PHP unit test case class with 100,000 <laughs> tests. It had the same test code, just different test data in it. He ran that, he got the 100,000 dots on the command line and the 100,000 lines in the XML and the 100,000 tests in the PDF and the manager was happy. But he was not happy. And he exp told that story to me and asked whether or not he missed the feature in PHP unit that was there to help him with that. And I said, no, but you just have given me the idea for a new feature. And that's when I implemented um, data providers, which allows, um, the decoupling of test code from test data. So really stupid example, we have a method test add that gets three input arguments, A, B, and C. It builds the sum of A and B and compares that to C. That test method has an annotation, data provider, with the name of a method that can be in the same class. It could also be in another class, foo, double colon, double colon, whatever, and that data provider can return one of two things. In this simple example, we just return an array of arrays, and for each array, those elements are mapped onto the input arguments of the test in order. We could also return an object that implements PHP's iterator interface, and that iterator would have to return in each it in each iteration step an array, and then the same, same deal. So what the developer that I talked about earlier ended up doing was he implemented a CSV at the iterator that iterated over the lines, over the rows of the CSV file, and that put him into a position where he could tell 
the domain experts to put the CSV file in a specific place and you didn't have to touch the test code anymore. And every time the CSV file was changed, the tests were updated automatically. And if you run this with PHP unit on the command line, you actually see that it's treated as four tests. And when one of those tests fails, it tells uh, you for which data set it failed. No, it's just the name that I put there. So data provider is the keyword, if you will, and I can use any name that I want here. So, the, so, the, so what PHP unit does internally, it will run in its setup phase the provider method, gets the data, uh, the data sets, and for each data set, create a test case that is to be run. And it gets its te test data injected. And around the same time, um, Test NG, one of the two major unit testing frameworks in the Java world, added a similar uh, feature. Yes? I don't know if it makes sense, but um, would, would it be easier to, to have the provider being sent from the command line? So that you can run the, the specific uh, PHP unit test, mm -hmm. which is all the same, but what you want to do is actually test the data instead of the code. You don't need a specific feature for that. You can do that with other features of PHP unit. So what you can do is, so PHP unit has a, um, an XML configuration file, and in the XML configuration file you can set constants or global variables, for instance, and make that <coughs> configurable there, and one of the big refactorings that's currently going on that's not going to make it into PHP unit uh, 4.2, but hopefully into 4.3, is a refactoring of the configuration system. And once that refactoring is in place, it will be possible to set things that currently can only be configured using the configuration file also via a generic mechanism on the command line. So for instance, dash dash, PHP constant, name, value, whatever. Yes. It's already possible what you want, but not as elegant um, as one might want. Okay, so that works. Brilliant timing, use a configuration file. Um, originally, or in, or in the beginning, the PHP unit XML configuration file was really, really simple. It only could be used to point PHP unit at the directory where your tests are. So you never have to uh, point PHP unit there. It grew from there. Um, and by far, this is not everything that you can do, but it's the most common things uh, that you can and should do in your XML configuration file. Bootstrap. It's just like PHP unit dash dash bootstrap on the command line. Points PHP unit to a PHP script that should be loaded before it starts running the tests. This should ideally just be your auto loader, but sometimes you need more setup, database connections or whatever. So that's the place to do it. By default, PHP unit makes a backup of all global and super global variables before it starts a test and restores that backup after each test. This is a very time and memory consuming operation that is only necessary for unclean code. So if your code is clean, turn off this feature. Your test suite will run much faster and it will use less memory. And you can turn it off globally in the configuration file and turn the feature on using an annotation on, using an annotation on a test by test basis. You know, most of my code is clean, but I have some parts of the system where I need to touch global variables, then only for those few tests enable this feature. Don't slow down the entire test suite just because a couple of tests. 
the default is true, at some point I want to switch the default. But then I will be the evil German again. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, strict mode, like I mentioned earlier, really fine grained configuration now, which is good. Uh, before it wasn't all or nothing, we had just strict. The strict flag is still there. If you use strict, it turns all individual settings either on or off based on whether you set strict to on or off. Um, I want to deprecate the strict configuration setting at some point because it's not e needed anymore. And f again, evil German in me, at some point I would like to enable some of the now fine-grained strict settings by default. For instance, by default, yell at tests that don't do anything. And then you can have a test suite, and it's best practice to run the tests that are quick first, like run the unit tests first. Doesn't make sense to try to run large scale tests before the small scale tests when the small scale tests already tell you that something is broken. There's no point in running the larger tests. You can configure logging using the XML configuration files, especially useful um, for continuous integration. Report test result information using JUnit XML, code coverage information using Clover XML, code coverage report in HTML format to a directory. Most importantly, use a whitelist. By default, PHP Unit uses a blacklist approach to decide whether or not a file that was executed while running the test suite, uh, to put it, whether or not to put it into the code coverage report. By default, it uses a blacklist, and the blacklist is pre-filled with PHP unit's own source code plus the source code of its dependencies. That sort of works, but it's much nicer to use a whitelist approach and tell PHP unit, my code is in this one directory or in these two directories. And then you have even the option of telling PHP unit, please put all files that are on the whitelist in my code coverage report, even if they are not yet executed as part of the test suite. So you get a really clear picture of which parts of the code are not tested at all yet, and which are at least to some degree tested. So summary in a nutshell. Be descriptive about what you're testing. That shouldn't be a problem if you're doing test-driven development, but it's also not a problem if you're not doing TDD. Just it can be a problem if you don't know what you're testing, but then trying to come up with a, a descriptive test name and failing at doing that will tell you, make it really clear to you, hey, take a step back, think about what you want to do. Um, thinking usually helps, and it's not a bad thing. Be explicit about what you're testing, use the coverage annotation, make it explicit that with this test you want to cover this unit of code. Use the most specific assertion possible, actually use assertions, test something, decouple test code from test data, use a configuration file, and most importantly, write real unit tests. Write tests that test one unit of code in isolation from all of its dependencies. Use stubbing and mocking. And I'd like to leave you um, with a quote by Mishko Heveri. Um, the secret in testing is in writing testable code. If the code is clean, if the code is testable, then writing a test is easy. And if there's one thing that I've learned over the last 13 years teaching developers PHP unit and testing is that it's really hard to get started with testing in an existing code base that was not written with testability in mind. It will be painful. It's easy to project or deflect the pain onto the thing that is new, which is the testing, which is the tool. 
testing is stupid, the tool is stupid, the guy who developed the tool is stupid. That's fine, I can live with that, but you probably don't want to live with that. It's too much of a pain to not test the code. So over time, you need to refactor your code to be clean, to be testable, and then testing is not a problem. Okay, any questions? There was only one, two, three, two. yes. Yes. So the software solution is how to choose the aspect mode. So we can try to pretty much mock all those static calls to make sure that our current code base has some testing and we can start refactoring. What's your opinion on this approach? It's a fetch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as you are clear of the fact that it's 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 a patch, it's a workaround, it's a bridge solution, yeah. and at some point you burn down that bridge and everything is, is fine. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But the situation that you're describing, um, it's called the legacy code dilem dilemma. Because you, you have code that is not testable, you want to refactor it, safe refactoring requires tests. So one solution there is to use a testing technique called characterization testing. A characterization test is a test that makes no statement about whether or not the code that you currently have <coughs> is correct or not. It just captures the way that the code currently behaves. And th there are ways to automatically generate um, these characterization tests using data from debuggers or profilers. Um, I've, a couple of times um, with teams at customers, written um, scripts that use output from Xdebug to automatically generate characterization test code. I've tried a couple of times to make that into a generic solution because I want to open source something like this but it always was so specific that it doesn't make sense yet to open source. Maybe at some point I have an idea or somebody else have an idea to how to make this generic, that would be awesome. But the principle um, can be applied in a lot of situations. You can also do this characterization testing um, by manually recording front end tests using Selenium for instance. Just capture the way that the outwardly visible behavior is right now. But of course, that also comes with the problem of being uh, a large scope test that can only tell you whether or not it works. It cannot pinpoint. Yeah. Well, is there, let's say, is there a solution? I've tried with the machine testing time. I've tried to hold an official session about how we try to fix this problem. No, unfortunately not. <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, feel free to send me an email, ask questions. Yep. Do you find yourself being sensitive to pushing your own updates with how much time you could expect everyone else is using the software? Do I find myself affected by how often I push and how many people are affected by my pushing of new software out. Uh, I don't know. It's all <sighs> to put it in a different way. I never expected when I started to work on PHP and that so many people would be using it. And for the first couple of years that I was working on PHP unit, it felt like nobody was using it but me. First time I spoke at a conference about it, I had two people in the audience, one of which came to me afterwards and said, I was only he here in this room because this was the only session in German in this time <laughs> slot. <laughs> so 
So I had one. Um, it changed over the years. It's. Um, <laughs> before, before PHP Unit um, 4.1, it was really scary to publish a new release because, yes, PHP Unit, of course, is tested with PHP Unit. Uh, and before we make a major release, I run the, uh, the, the PHP Unit version that I'm about to release using the test suite of Zen Framework, of Symfony, of doctrine of major components, libraries, frameworks to make sure whether or not I get the same output than with the previous version of PHP unit. And that it would be a showstopper um, if a test had worked with one version and it's not supposed to not work with the new version. Um, so I would fix that. But I'm not as scared or it's Scared is probably the wrong word. I'm not as nervous or whatever as I used to be because the releases are so much smaller. I know there is not that much that has changed between 4.0 and 4.1. And I know exactly what to look for. Oh, oh, there's a major change in how we generate mock objects. So I should focus on tests that use the mocking functionality. So it's become much more manageable. But if I look at the download numbers, yes, it affects a lot of uh, a lot of people. I mean, there's um, in the first 12 months that it was available by a composer and on packages, there were over a million downloads. And yes, th that's because everyone has it in the continuous integration server. But I see the number of downloads uh, for the FAR, which are also about 10,000 per day. So it, yes, it affects a lot of people. Maybe it should scare me more, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they're kicking us out. Yeah.